our story. What we're most proud of is our... Would you use it? Only if I had to, yes. Under what circumstances? If they threatened... <laughs> That's quite a lethal looking weapon, what is it? In the land of quite a bit. Would you use it? Only if I had to, yes. Under what circumstances? If they threaten to kill somebody in here or except do damage to anybody. Have you ever used a gun on a human? No. But you would under life threatening circumstances? I think so, yes. So you say you've been robbed. In the land of Good morning, my name is Steve Wyatt. Uh, I'm usually on the other side of the camera at a time like this, but Jack unfortunately is feeling a little bit under the weather today, so he won't be in this morning. I'm going to try to fill his shoes. First of all, we have an update on that hostage situation in Ottawa. It is now over. The two gunmen have been arrested by police and given up all the hostages. This was the scene this morning at the Turkish Embassy when two armed men from the Armenian, an Armenian organization overtook the embassy and took 11 hostages. One security guard was shot to death and they held 11 hostages. Uh, one other person was injured. The identities of all these people still have not been released. On the phone from Ottawa right now, I have John McKay. He's the uh, uh, reporter for Broadcast News on Parliament Hill. John, are you there? Yes, good morning, Steve. John, can you update us on what's happening right now? Well, just about 35 to 40 minutes ago, the incident ended. It began at 7 a.m. Eastern time here, so it took all together about four and a half hours. Uh, details are still a bit sketchy, but police uh, moved in, and uh, the incident ended apparently peacefully. Uh, they carted all the uh, hostages away, some of them in ambulances. There were, of course, uh, two casualties. Uh, the ambassador himself, who either fell or was pushed from an upper story window and has, I believe, maybe a broken arm and leg, and a security guard, uh, reports coming in now uh, seem to suggest he is, in fact, dead. He shot it out with the gunman early this morning, was shot in the chest, and was lying in the courtyard all morning during this incident in the rain with uh, blood all over his chest. He was left lying in the courtyard outside the embassy. I beg your pardon? He was left lying in the courtyard? Uh, yes, he was in the line of fire and they couldn't rescue him. The ambassador, on the other hand, was out of the line of fire, and, but with a policeman, they couldn't get him out of there either all during this incident because uh, to get to him and away from him would have, uh, would have been dangerous. What do we know about the two men who uh, took the hostages in the first place? Well, it's obviously another Armenian incident, the third in as many years. As you may recall, they shot up a Turkish uh, diplomat a couple of years ago and then uh, killed a military attache uh, two years ago, Altikat. Uh, they call themselves here the Armenian Revolutionary Army, and at this point officials aren't sure what sort of a branch uh, or cell that is of the uh, Armenian terrorists. Um, their cause is the same, of course. They want uh, land uh, returned to them and an acknowledgement from the Turkish government about this uh, massacre, this million, half a million to a million and a half Armenians that were massacred back in 1915. Now, we heard also that the ambassador's wife and daughter were being held as well. Are they safe? Uh, yes, they are. Another woman was either injured or just hysterical and suffering from shock and was taken away. But among the dozen or so hostages were the ambassador's wife and uh, one of his uh, children. Um, he's a new ambassador there. Uh, the first names that were given out were wrong, apparently, because uh, no one here really realized that the ambassador had just changed uh, uh, recently. Koskun Kirka is his name. Right. The, the, it, was, it was him then, indeed, Koskun Kirka? Is that the one who was taken hostage? Uh, yes, well, we're not sure the details of what happened. As I say, he was either pushed or fell from an upper floor window during this, this whole incident and was lying there with, a, I guess, a broken leg or something uh, against the wall of the embassy in, in part of the courtyard, uh, and uh, he's been taken away in an ambulance. Have the police uh, released the identity of the two men? Uh, no, not at this point. I think they, uh, they grabbed them. Uh, just before the incident was over, one of them appeared, smashed a window and appeared uh, in a window at the embassy with a semi-automatic uh, gun pointed at one of the hostages' heads. And I guess they wanted to, uh, I get the impression here that they wanted to settle and, uh, 
end the thing. And uh, so it ended. They were uh, thrown to the ground uh, and cuffed and carted off uh, very quickly. There were uh, apparently some arrests earlier this morning as well. At about the time the incident began, some eyewitnesses at an old H home next door said they saw police throw men over the hood of a car, cuff them, and take them off. And that's all a bit sketchy yet as to uh, what part that incident seems to have played in the beginning of the incident. So although no names have been released yet, John, the uh, incident is over. The embassy is secure now. Police are inside, and most of the hostages are safe and sound, uh, except for the one security guard who is dead. Right. And at last report, police and that we're still conducting floor by floor searches with dogs. They're looking for any explosives that may have been left behind, booby traps, or a possibility of still another terrorist uh, somewhere inside. Okay, John, thanks very much for your help on this one, and uh, maybe we can get in touch with you later as the uh, situation progresses. Okay, Steve. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Earlier this morning, uh, BCTV NewsHour's correspondent in Ottawa, Harvey Oberfeld, actually got through to one of the hostage takers on the telephone there, and we have part of his conversation to play for you now. It's the Turkish Embassy. This is British Columbia Television in Vancouver. Can I ask you which group I'm talking to? Armenian Revolutionary Army. The Armenian Revolutionary Army. And you are in the embassy right now? Yes, we are. Can you tell me what is happening there and why you have entered the embassy the way you have? Well, we want, uh, we got demands from Turkish embassy, from Turkish government. And what are those demands? Uh, We want our lands back, the Armenian lands, and we want the Turkish government to recognize the Armenian genocide. The Armenian genocide, could you, well, what, you're referring to what happened in 1915? Yes. And just briefly for our viewers, what uh, specifically are you referring to? Well, I can't tell you now. Okay. I have to go. Can I ask you just very I quickly, have to go. Sorry. Can, can I just ask you quickly one question? Yes. Uh, is anybody injured inside? No. No one is injured? No one is injured. And when are you going to be coming out or what are you, are you negotiating? We have hostages now. In a- you have hostages. Yes. How many? Well, I can't tell you that. Uh, but uh, how many are you in there? Uh, I can't tell you that either. Okay, but uh, are you negotiating now with the Turkish government or with Canadian authorities? Uh, no, not now. Nothing yet? No. And you don't know how long you're going to be staying? You have uh, No. Any specific demands as far as, uh, uh, you say, the release of the lands? If the Turkish government won't release the lands, what are you going to do then? I can't, uh, I can't tell you anything. Can I ask who I'm talking to? Sorry, I can't. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. So as we know now, that incident is now over. Two men are under arrest in Ottawa. One security guard at the Turkish embassy has been killed. The rest of the hostages now we, uh, are, appear to be all right, although we don't know for sure and no identities have been released. As soon as we find out, we'll let you know. We have other news this morning. First on the list is Surrey, where merchants there are frightened, worried, and prepared to fight back with violence in some cases because of an outbreak of teen violence, harassment, and vandalism, and robberies in in that city. And last night in Surrey, those merchants got together with the town council and were demanding 54 more RCMP officers added to the police force. They came with money, prepared to pay for that stronger force themselves. And one spokesperson was there to explain why she thinks the merchants in Surrey need more policemen now to protect them from an increase in this violence. Well, council approved eight additional officers, BC funding cutbacks have resulted in the loss of seven officers due to the police picking up the duties of serving documents. A further three effective officers have been lost. We need more police officers and we need them now. If council and the RCMP are unable to do this without raising taxes, then either one, have the courage to increase taxes in order to find adequate policing, two, put the issue to the people of Surrey in a plebiscite vote. Council, though, turned down 54 more policemen, so the merchants handed over checks for $25 each, which they say would cover the cost for an increased police force. The uh, situation there is getting so bad that some merchants are even arming themselves against this outbreak of uh, armed robberies. This is Paul Parody from the Fraser Valley Growers Association. He even has a shotgun under his counter. He said last night, here he is here this morning, and he's prepared to say that he's ready to use that gun if he has to and take the law into his own hands if he can't get any help. With him is Cliff Lindbergh from the Van de Kamp Bakery. We saw him on the news last night as well. He's prepared to do the same thing if he has to. And with the both of them is Bonnie Schrenk. She's an alderman from Surrey. And she supports the call for 54 more policemen, although the council voted last night only to increase the force by eight. 
Also in the news is the uh, renewed arms talks in Geneva in the wake of the death of uh, Chernyenko and the Soviet Union, leader of the Soviet Union. We want to find out what's happening now in the Soviet Union with the new leader and how that will affect the arms talks. And with us today is Professor Mike Wallace, an expert whom you've met before on the issue of Star Wars, and he's going to tell us how the uh, death of Chernyenko and the new leadership within the Soviet Union is going to affect those talks. Also, we have uh, Geraldine Schwartz here, who's, who's come up with a plan called Thinker Size. If you're wondering what that means, uh, what she's going to say is we don't use enough of our brains, and she's going to try to tell us how we can think better and help our kids think better and just become all around a lot smarter. And first of all, we'll be back with the Surrey situation after the break. Would you use it? Only if I had to, yes. Under what circumstances? If they threaten to kill somebody in here or except do damage to anybody. Have you ever used a gun on a human? No. But you would under life threatening circumstances? I think so, yes. Now you say you'd be looking at about that. Oh. Sorry. If you've just joined me, my name is Steve Wyatt. I'm sitting in for Jack today. He's off sick today. He's got this horrible flu that seems to be ravaging the entire lower mainland these days. But in the meantime, I have here Paul Parody, Cliff Lindbergh, Morning. and Bonnie Shrink, Morning. all from Surrey, and they're concerned about this increase in violence that we get by teenagers, mostly in Surrey, uh, a town which has the largest RCMP force in the country, and still the, uh, the crime rate there is uh, almost frightening. And Paul, we saw you on the news last night with a shotgun telling us that you were prepared to use it if you had to against a teenager. Yes, if it was against to defend the store against somebody being hurt on my part, my staff, my wife, my children, whatever. Tell me your situation. How many times have you been robbed? Uh, three times since uh, 9th of January. Are you uh, unique in this uh, determination to no. take the law into your own hands? No, I'm not. There's other merchants have purchased guns as the Gun shop stated yesterday the sales are up 35% since Christmas. Let's just take a look at the incidents of crime in Surrey just for a minute, just so we can get a handle on what's happening there. Uh, you can see in 1984, in the cases of armed robbery, there were 14 armed robberies a month. In 1985, there were 22. That's up 35% in a year. Break and enters. 1983, there were 4,300. 1984, there were 5,300. That's up 24%. And homicides, the most violent crime. 1983, there were four. Last year, there were 13. That's a 325% increase. Bonnie Shrink, you're an alderman in Surrey. Yes. You're calling for a pretty big increase in the number of policemen mm -hmm. in, that, in that city. Why? Well, it started out with our RCMP police force calling a press conference to warn the public of the situation in our municipality. We had approximately um, statistics given to us of 600 breaking and enterings a month. Now, the residents there, you know, sh should be aware of that happening so that they can take proper precautions to protect their homes in the daytime and evening. There's a rash of uh, young offenders that are out there during the daytime. Tell me about these homes. young offenders. Who are they? Well, a lot of them that we found out that have gone through the court have been high school dropouts. Just kids out getting their kicks, going into homes. Uh, some of them are in organized fencing operations. <coughs> And uh, they go in and take cash, liquor, uh, take orders for various goods in homes and sell them. Cliff Lindbergh, you're, uh, you run the Van de Camp Bakery in Surrey, correct? correct? Yes. Tell me about you. What have you uh, been up against in the last couple of months? Well, we had uh, 12 break-ins in the last two years, including a $44,000 fire. Was it arson? You sure it's arson? Yes, it was. They could not find anything, no money or uh, anything valuable to them. So they just gathered a bunch of papers and set it, set it ablaze. How many of the people who have robbed you or destroyed your property, how many of those teenagers, all of them? Do we, do, we don't you know. Don't, oh, how many of them been arrested, charged, and None. convicted? None. None. All the break-ins were no, uh, noticed by myself, except by one incident, which happened on a Sunday evening at 6 p.m. The RCMP officer noticed the break-in in the window, the breakage of the window. He entered the window and he got hold of one of the uh, persons which broke in and while he was trying to transfer them into the police car he ripped loose and he lost them. Now how can you be sure that in every instance it's teenagers from Surrey? That's a, I mean aren't you in danger of generalizing about the youth in that municipality? Well the thing is uh, most of the break-ins are done by teenager or 
early 20s because we have nothing which is really of value. It's the only thing what we have is food. Well, how much have you lost then? I mean, can you put a dollar figure? Yes, on roughly it? about $10,000, $11,000. $8,000 because of the fire to products and uh, furnitures which were not covered by insurance. And on other occasions, also of products like bacon, candy bars. Mm -hmm. Foodstuffs. Foodstuffs. Have, have, have you also followed uh, the pattern of keeping firearms in your yes, establishment? Yes, I did. And you're prepared to use them if you have yes, to? Yes, I have to. Isn't that a bit extreme? These are teenagers we're talking about here. Well, the thing is, uh, they do not come alone. They come either in threes, fours, fives, in gangs. Have you had to use a firearm yet? No, I have not. What kind of firearm is it? It's an M16. An M16? That's a semi-automatic yes. rifle. Well, whatever you want to call it. Well, that's a, that's a military weapon, which is illegal in this country. Well, a lot possessed? of things are illegal. They are done. But you're, you're taking the law illegally into your own hands and prepared to do that? Well, the thing is, what do you want me to do? But I mean, Either I'm going to get killed. Has your life been threatened yet? Not yet. But I have moved in on my promises last October. And since I've been living on the promises, we had no more break-ins. I mean, you're prepared to tell me that you're ready to pull out an M16 automatic rifle and pull the trigger on a, a group of teenagers who just want a loaf of bread, perhaps? Well, we don't know what they want. And since I'm alone at nights there, I have to be prepared. I mean, if there is only one coming, I take one on by myself. It's just terrifying for you. It is. prepared to do that. It is. And the same for you too, Paul. Well, I wouldn't go to extremes of uh, trying to kill them. I think I would be more try to hold them for but the But with police. a shotgun like that, is it, it's going to do a lot of damage. Well, down at their legs or whatever. It depends on what they had. If they come in empty-handed, fine, I'll tackle them empty-handed. They come in with a knife, that's not so bad. But when they start coming in with guns... This sounds like a siege mentality in Surrey. Well, uh, not to be an alarmist, but the facts of life are, in 1984, we had 172 armed robberies. That is, people, not necessarily juveniles, adults going into corner stores, gas stations, for quite innocent employees are, are employed, 172 armed robberies, that is with guns, firearms, uh, weapons such as knives, clubs, nunchucks. To date in Surrey for the first two months, we've had 44 armed robberies. That is the hard statistical facts. That is what the police are alarmed with. And with an undermanned police force, and you look at Surrey in comparison to Vancouver, where we have uh, 724 citizens per policeman. Vancouver has 424 citizens per policeman. The BC average uh, is around 622. That force is severely undermanned. Quite frankly, I prefer to not listen to the ramblings of politicians trying to make political points on a budget. I look at crime prevention and a safe community to live in. That is the utmost importance with myself. What guarantee, though, is there that 54 more policemen are going to have any real impact here? Well, it, they become not just a reactionary force with their criminal caseload. When your criminal caseload gets over 100, it becomes not a livable um, fact of life to deal with. We are at 116 uh, criminal caseload per police officer. That's excluding traffic. So rather than have files just coming in and not being dealt with and solved. They're just sitting there. That is not sufficient in a municipality our size, one of the fastest growing in British Columbia to mm. have happen. With already the largest police force in the country. The police are needed mm. there and I think they have made their point very clear. Now if they don't get them this year, we're going to get eight more officers. Uh, we may have a review of the budget later on in the fall and more may be required. At okay, some point uh, in time, they're going to need some. Let's break you off there. If this is happening in Surrey, there's little doubt that this is probably happening elsewhere. If you have calls to my guests here now, something about your own community that you're worried about, give us a call now and we'll be back with more on the crime situation in Surrey after the break. If you just joined us, my name is Steve Wyatt. I'm normally Jack's co-producer on this uh, little effort every day, but I'm sitting in because he's feeling sick this morning. With me is Bonnie Schrank, Surreyman, uh, Alderman from Surrey, Cliff 
Lindbergh from the Van de Kamp Bakery in Surrey and Paul Parody, both businessmen from Surrey who have been up against an increasing amount of violent crime from teenagers in that community and say they're even prepared to take the law into their own hands with firearms if need be. Bonnie, Surrey has been the butt of so many jokes for so many years now. What's this doing to the municipality? Well, this type of publicity obviously is going to affect economic development. There, there's no doubt about that. It affects the real estate industry. Um, they are concerned now. The president of the real estate board said that, you know, people are shying away from Surrey and, and such. I think the real estate people and the community, the Chamber of Commerce, have to get behind the police department and put political pressure on council to reverse the decision and get the manpower up. But it does affect the image, it affects investment, eventually it affects taxation, it has a rippling effect right down. But on the other hand, Surrey is quite capable of talking about their problems, of going after some solutions, and maybe our community from all this will be a safer place to live. Let's ask Paul that. Paul, you as a businessman in the community, you must know some of these teenagers you say are breaking into your business. I do. Who uh, are they? They're just... Like Bonnie said, the average dropout, and they've moved up the line in the last five years. And basically, the whole thing is they're bored. Surrey has no industry for them to go into work. They've never gone after the. Are these kids in school? Some are in school, but very few. Most of them are out of school. They're, they have nothing to do. And what, if you, I mean, short of this firearms business, what what can you do to? Like, is there no way that you can establish some kind of? perhaps naive, establish a rapport with these kids? and I have a certain rapport with the kids. I talk to them quite a bit, but the problem still stems. They're from Surrey, such a vast area. Mm -hmm. They come from all over. I have a unique little store on the highway. I get along with them. This gentleman, apparently, that robbed us last time was from New Westminster. Uh, we're attracting the crowds over from the other parts of the city because and if you take a look at your crime rate, it's basically from baby bonus day till about four or five days after welfare day. Mm -hmm. Mother and father aren't working. They don't want them around the house. So they're out on the streets. They basically have nowhere to go. They can't go to work. There's no future for them. Surrey is not provided for that. They have chased away industry rather than bring it in. Are, no. you, are you convinced that the more police is going to fix the problem? It's, it it's seems gonna, like a band-aid. It's, it's going to deter the problem for now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the, uh, I think if they were on foot patrol and making themselves more visible, yes, it would slow it down. Uh, the only thing I can reiterate to that is Detroit, murder city of the world, which their crime has dropped almost 70 percent. Their police force from their height is down 20 percent as well. Cliff, what about, what about you? Has your business uh, uh, gone down in the wake of all these uh, incidents? It has not gone down because we mostly do deal with people of low income. But like Mr. Parody mentioned, police force is the only answer. We should have at nighttime foot patrol and not that the police officer is cruising around in the car, just uses his spotlight and shines at the, at the store doors. Are the police, you know, helping you so, so far? I mean, that's, that's not like the impression that the police aren't doing yes. anything in Surrey. We have, I think, one of the best constables, that, or sergeant, I think he is now, that works with the kids in Larry Atkins, that spends a lot of time. He makes himself visible with the kids. He has a good rapport with them. And this is the kind of thing, but the, you only got one. We need 50 We have with three the kids. Uh, crime prevention officers going into 90 schools, 30, 30 schools per average officer doing crime prevention program there. We've got a new one on victim services coming in under the complete control of the RCMP and a new block watch, neighborhood watch program where identification uh, will be put on all valuables. Hopefully we're going to have a family court established where we'll have rapport with senior judges and probation officers on community service work orders so that everybody doesn't just go into court, have their hands slapped and are out in the street. But it you sounds know, the like the justice system is becoming a yeah. joke. But the it young sounds offenders like they're not even getting that far. No, they're According to Cliff here, none of the people who have robbed his place have even been arrested or charged yet. Well, again, well, that's back to criminal caseload. If it can't be solved and you're reactionary and you're just going after B&E and after B&E, you know, you can't get to the paperwork to do crime solving. Perhaps what I'm getting at, though, is uh, maybe these... Can you identify these kids as being from Surrey? Are you sure that they're Surrey residents? I mean, maybe not, they're from... They're not all from Surrey. No, they're not uh, all. The law, uh, about a month and a half ago, three teenagers got arrested and apparently charged 
with breaking an entry and possession of burglary tools. There was one 14-year-old kid involved, which mm -hmm. got arrested at 1 a.m. in the morning, trying to break into a snack and to a restaurant. And he had on his possession a crowbar, a bolt cutter, and three screwdrivers. And he was from Port Coquitlam, and his mother was living in Ontario. So Surrey is an easy hit. It is an easy hit. That's why we have to get back to the basic. We have to have the extra police force. And council right now is trying to talk their way out of it. Is eight not enough? No. Perhaps no. that's all that Surrey can afford. It's not enough. We need more on the street. You need at least 15 more on the street. And what Bonnie said, I agree 100% with. That would be Atkinson's group going into the schools. They need at least 10 more there. But nobody wants to pay more taxes to hire Hey, them. listen. It's a what matter are you of priorities in the council. If you want to have $26 million worth of land speculation, fine. If you want to spend $5 million in a wave action pool, that's fine too. It's not a shortage of funds. It's a priority of where budget monies are going to be spent. Now, a $5 million wave action pool will be nice for Newton. But the juveniles that may or may not have to get off the street, the, the fee's not set yet. But if they're going to pay $7 to go in and ride away, many of these families are low income. That is not the type of program where you get to a juvenile. We're having a new juvenile program through Parks and Recreation that will get to the hard to handle youth. Okay, okay let's, let's get we're a handle on We're not going to babysit them, but we're going to interject a new program. What there. about the cost, though? 54 policemen would have cost how much more a year to police? Approximately, for eight new policemen, it's a uh, cost plus a clerk of $326,000. That's for eight That's plus for a clerk. That's for eight, which the council has now S voted to approve. That's right. Now, so you're looking at approximately $1.2 million to put the complement as requested by the RCMP into operation. And you say that can be raised without raising taxes? That would cause, uh, if you want to change your priorities the spending round, that's fine. If you don't want to change your priorities, then you're going to go for a tax increase of approximately $20 to $25 per home. And you're prepared to pay that? Yes. Yes. You're prepared what, to pay what, that? what is the difference of paying $25 in taxes or $500 on your insurance or no insurance at all? Okay. We'll be back with your calls on this topic right after the break. My guests are all from Surrey, and they're all having bad problems with an increase in violence against their businesses there. And we're going to take your calls now. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. Good morning. I'm lucky I managed to escape my youth without a criminal record. <laughs> Why? Uh, lucky, I guess. Didn't get caught. I know how these people feel about the youth, but I also know the the feeling from the side of the youth too. Which is? Well, there's two main things that can be done, I believe. One is to throw them all in jail, or the other create some quality programs to keep them off the street. Okay, why don't we let Bonnie answer that one? What do you think about that? I think that he's got a good point. We have to get some programs that are geared to teenagers, not just youngsters or older people in the community. That teenage group, the 13 to 17 group, has got to have some organized programs, dances, drop-in centers, and you can't start it off on a large basis, but he has got a good point. We've got to get them off the streets roaming. Are you too prepared to engage in some kind of um, work with the young people in, in, uh, sure in Surrey? Sure yeah? right. Okay, How's, how about that caller? I'm not, I'm not talking about, uh, about these uh, insignificant, uh, low-cost uh, programs that have been put up in the past. I'm talking about know, the community uh, dances or karate classes or you know, things that are real temporary, but they just don't work. Uh, so we need some kind of permanent um, help for these kids. Well, we Keep have them busy, a in other job words, action and... center for you that a lot of people are not aware of. I think a lot of them just want a job mm. and, and want some temporary employment so they have some money in their mm. pocket. Right. I'd rather have uh, employment, even if part-time, put some Wouldn't money in all? the kids' <laughs> pockets. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I don't make that an excuse for B&E, yeah. but it's a shortage of money out there. Okay, caller, thanks very much. Go ahead, please. Yes, good, uh, good morning, Steve. Morning. Um, First off, I'd like to say that I am definitely in sympathy with the uh, merchants and residents of Surrey and having to deal with their increased juvenile problem that they have there. But I have absolutely no sympathy for the Surrey Council uh, 
uh, in dealing with the RCMP as their police force in that area. How about that, Bonnie? I think that they're, uh, if they were smart, they would uh, do what a lot of the other municipalities in the area are planning on doing. That's phasing out the costly RCMP services in favor of their own municipal police force. Thereby, they can cut costs however they choose. That's a good question. Is that an alternative? Go ahead. I, I answer to you, caller, is this. Uh, at this time, I, I feel that Surrey Council is not capable with the people that we have in there running our own police force. In time, I would like to see it. I talked to Alderman Campbell on this. His feeling he wants a, a, a Metropolitan Police Force in there. But the RCMP are doing quite an ad adequate job now. And but I, what he's I, talking about, I think, is from a financial point of what, view. What I'm saying is I don't think Surrey could handle it. They, mm -hmm. they are geared for a small bedroom. This is big business that we're talking about, and Surrey just can't handle big business. Is that something the council might have well, considered? Well, a municipal time? police force, if you want to look at a large, massive increase in taxation, that would definitely be the route to go. I don't favor that. I like no. the RCMP. I like the subsidy we get from the federal-provincial agreement, which we pay 85% of our costs and are subsidized 15. Mm -hmm. You get into a municipal police force uh, like Vancouver, then you're looking at the two-man patrol car. We have one officer in a car out there all the time, and we have 200 RCMP auxiliaries. So in cost, when you look at cost savings, it's very effective to have an RCMP force police us at this point in time. Does that answer your question, caller? Well, I feel that, uh, that the two-man uh, patrol car isn't necessarily the, the, the firm fact that it's going to be that way. I think that uh, West Vancouver is a good example as for that. They have their own municipal police force, and they seem to be doing rather well compared to a lot of the other uh, municipalities who are suffering under costly RCMP uh, procedures in, in policing. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. I, I ask you, I'm going to ask the caller this. Do uh, Vancouver have foot patrols? And are you approving of foot patrols? Uh, myself, um, I see once in a while in uh, downtown Vancouver and in the West End areas, they do have the... That, uh, that option of having a foot patrol uh, uh, patrol the area. I think that's, that's highly uh, efficient in terms of being visible and uh, it does deter certain types of violence, I believe, and, and problems, other situations as well. Okay. I think that might be the answer in that area. Okay, what do you th why do you think that foot patrols are gonna make any difference? Well, okay, the presence of authority is going to deter a lot. But a police cruiser will do that, won't it? No, it won't. A police cruiser is going to miss 60% of your crime. Mm -hmm. okay? okay, he's going past at a speed where a constable or whatever is walking. Mm -hmm. he, the kids see him. If they see him enough. They're going to become to know him. They're going to look up to him. I see. It's the old beat cop. You got it. Okay. So, go ahead from Campbell River. Hey, go ahead. How are you? Good, thanks. Well, good morning. Good morning. Okay. Listen, first of all, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that older person can answer it. Um, how much would it cost the taxpayer um, for the additional eight RCMP people? And the second thing I'd like to say uh, before I hang up and listen to your comments is that we have about 15 or 20 RCMP people running around Camel River pinching people for, you know, going five or ten miles over the speed limit, not having their seat belts on, uh, two or three cars stopping people every time I go to town, and uh, maybe I could just transfer some of them over there to really help crime and these people who are packing guns now to try and help themselves. Thank okay. you. Bye. How about you answer that one, buddy? You're not the older person, but we'll let you answer it anyway. The cost of the um, eight officers and the clerk, the support staff, is 326000 That is in the budget. Uh, I agree which has with, been approved. Yes, I agree with the caller's comment, which is a lot of the public feel the same way. They don't necessarily like radar traps and seat belt checks and that type of thing. They'd rather see a patrol car going through a residential community, and if they see a youngster out of school in the middle of the daytime walking mm -hmm. around with a bag, a gym mm -hmm. bag, they know that that's suspicious and can, you know, do checks on that. Um, that well, but then you're going to get all kinds of problems, aren't okay. you? Harassing children on the streets because they have no, you're bags. Harassing the good kids, yeah. the bad kids. We don't know who's good and who's bad. Well, I suggest this: that if you have a child that's in the age of a teenager, they should be in school. They shouldn't be out wandering around the streets with no gym bag in the middle of the day. Yeah. And but we the have fact to look is, at the dropout situation. Yeah. No, 
we can't just ignore this freedom of rights and freedom to wander in the streets because that's when these B&Es are taking place. It's up to our school board, our school system, the police and the citizens that if they see suspicious people walking around these neighborhoods during the day, phone the police and Sounds mail them. Sounds like you want them. truant officers again. Listen, I, I don't mind a truant officer one darn bit because that's when our crime is taking place. Between 12 noon and 4 o'clock when these people are out of their homes working or whatever, these homes are being broken into. I don't consider it, you know, the least bit um, funny that you can sort of underline that or put it aside. It's a fact of life. 600 B&Es a month, majority of them happening during the day. Okay. Now, um, that to me what? suggests that there's got some yeah. teenagers wandering around there that shouldn't be wandering around. Cliff, then we're getting back to the basic point again. Why yeah. are we talking about big figures? The basic price, what would it cost us, is $25 to get the whole 52 or 54 new officers. Okay. And no homeowner or a taxpayer would object to $25. Okay. But why is Surrey throwing up a stumbling block about it? Okay, hold that and we'll be back with one more segment of, segment of calls on this after the break. If you just joined us, my name is Steve Wyatt. I'm sitting in for Jack today because he's uh, feeling a little bit under the weather. And we're talking about increases in teenage crime against merchants in particular in Surrey, but uh, the problem seems to be spreading elsewhere. Uh, go ahead, caller. Oh, good morning. Morning. I have a few comments this morning about the youth in Surrey. I live in Surrey. I've lived in Surrey on and off for over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And just the other day I came home and I have a back porch that's enclosed by a fenced yard where I keep my bo pop bottles and juice jugs and stuff like that. And they'd stolen all the pop bottles and all the things that weren't worth any money, like the juice jugs, were smashed all over my backyard. So this sounds like pure malice. Is that... <laughs> Yeah, that's... Well, is that a common I, occurrence? I can read. Uh, I'm going to use Farmer Kent's on the Fraser Highway. They've broken into that place four or five times. The money they've got out of there is very little, but the damage has been extensive. Uh, pay and Save store down there as well is the same. The damage has been extensive. Money and stuff has been very little. Many stores have been this way. Super Value and Newton. The mm -hmm. damage in there was astronomical. If you can picture uh, this is vandalism vandalism yes. along with the theft if you can actually picture peanut butter and honey and syrup mm -hmm. mixed together and spread out that's the kind of thing that mr. Harner went through are there gangs in Surrey organized gangs with names a la West no. Side Story no. No. no no we have a couple of um, what they call the hardcore youth down in the uh, Wally area Newton area they have a small following of toughs that hang around with them they're not an organized gang per se. Like so there's no the, gang wars? No, that's like just a myth and, and bad gossip and rumors on Surrey that's not true. So kids getting together for a night of kicks? I, I would say 95% of the kids are good. Mm. They just, they're bored. They have nowhere to go, nothing to do. Uh, our hotel's got names. The Newton Inn, for instance, is known as a meat market and so on and so forth down the line. Where's the kid going to go? Go ahead, caller. You had something else to add? Uh, my other comment is, I wonder what's wrong with the parent alert programs in the schools out here. My kids go to school, and if they're not at school, I get a phone call. Uh, what's that? Yeah, what's happening with that that's, then? Uh, I don't know. That's something to check with the Surrey School Board and perhaps bring it to their attention, I really caller. I really think that it would help a great deal if the parents did know their children were not attending school. I certainly agree, 100%. I'll tell you, most of you got two parents that are... Uh, working probably uh i honestly believe the teachers in this day and age don't give a damn believe it's it it's about time they started did giving a damn and that's all i have to i agree well where are the parents surely it's the parents who should know where their kids are I, i'm, I'm going to tell you a little story and this is quite true i had a family take off near me and say to their four kids paul up the store will feed you my wife and i kept those kids for two weeks mm -hmm. and then we had to make some arrangements they took off and went down south for a holiday and left them with fifteen dollars to eat for two weeks for four kids. Mm, sad. Go ahead, please. Yes, I've got two comments to make, and I would like to hear what the two gentlemen have to say when I finish. Sure, go ahead. I for I, I would not go into their establishment if I knew they were keeping automatic guns and shotguns behind their counter. Because yeah, I'm if not somebody sure comes I in when I'm in there and he makes a little bit of a false move, there's going to be splattering of bullets all over the place. That's right. How about that? Uh, call a... uh, just a minute. Number two, I would like to ask Bonnie Shrink. 
she said that she was tired of listening to the rambling of politicians. She is one of the biggest politicians out here in Surrey, and she goes for more issues than you can shake a stick at. Now, I'll hang up and I'll listen to your answers. Thank you. Thanks, caller. Well, I'm glad because I recognize that caller is a former alderman in Surrey. Um, the, the, the point is that um, politicians are not. The fact is the RCMP called the press conference. And uh, quite frankly, I'm fed up with the current council, the SME elected council on Surrey. I don't think they're doing a good job. They do not listen to the public. They ignore them. They ignore the police. And this has gone far beyond the, the realm of politics. This is whether or not you live in a safe community or not. And that, to me, yeah. uh, is, like His I said, bottom good, line. Though. I'm not sure I'd want to go into your store. Well, you've well, got an M16 rifle and you've okay. got a shotgun. You go ahead, Cliff. The, the guns, what we carry, are not for the customers. They are for the unexpected visitors at night. But suppose, I mean, you're on the edge. Suppose you're a little bit nervous someday. And I do not have my gun laying behind the counter. Mm. Because in the daytime, I don't, I'm not afraid of anybody. Mm. But the thing is, if we do not protect ourselves, the consumer will pay for it. The losses what we have have to be paid by somebody. Paul, what, what about you? Well, mine is uh, kept in the kitchen. It's basically for the night shift and afternoon shift. I, I don't feel at all that we'll ever use it. It's more there for deterrent than anything else. I'll reiterate on that. It was hanging out in public view for almost eight years. We never had a problem. Mm. Two years ago, we took it down and it got discarded in the back room. It come out rusty, et cetera, et cetera. Since then, we've had nothing but hassle. But the difference today is that you're a bit on edge. How do you know? I, it? God, uh, just one mistake. That's all I, it takes. I'll tell you what. I'm not really on edge, OK? Yeah. The first time I was robbed, the guy come in with a knife or a gun on my wife. I took a knife after him. I'm not on edge. Uh, but like don't you worry about making a mistake? I mean, all it takes no, is one no, and somebody's no, dead. No. I, I, I have a feeling that uh, my feeling itself, it was one way of bringing this to a bigger head. It was blown out of proportion. Uh, Bonnie is right. We can't get a damn thing from that council. It's not capable of living up to the business today. It's dealing with back in the 50s. Uh, our mayor, I don't know what to say about him. Uh, there's many, uh, whole of Surrey period is... Okay, well let's hope you don't have to use those weapons in my I thanks. I never will. My well, thanks like to both of you. I have to oh. cut it off now at that point, but thank you very much for, your, for coming. Thank you. And Bonnie, let's thanks to you. Let's hope things improve in sure Surrey. Well, it's and, just so uh, nobody has to pull the trigger. I mean, yeah. No, we won't. Okay. We don't, we won't, won't happen in Surrey like it did in Maple Ridge. We okay. Hope. Nope. My thanks to my guests, and we'll be back after the break with uh, Professor Mike Wallace on the Star Wars situation and the peace talks in Geneva after the break. This morning, there's a whole new picture inside the Soviet Union with the leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev taking over as, after the death of Chernyenko there. Professor Mike Wallace is an expert on Star Wars. He's been on the program before talking with Jack about the uh, myth or reality, whatever way you want to look at it, of Star Wars. How do you see this new leadership? Does it really make any difference in the long run who's sitting in the Kremlin? Well, it will in the long run. Um, as far as the uh, talks currently, I don't think so. Uh, the negotiators who are engaged in, in those talks now, people like Karpov, the head of the Soviet delegation, Gromyko, the foreign minister, have been around for many, many years, Gromyko's case more than 40 years, uh, dealing with the United States. Uh, their positions are uh, fairly uh, well known, uh, and right now the problem is not the, the leadership, but the fact that their positions on so many issues are um, light years apart. The Soviets have taken the position so far that SDI, the Strategic mm -hmm. Defense Init Initiative, or Star Wars has come to be known. They do they want to negotiate that issue separately because they obviously see it as a threat? Yeah, they want to, yes, they want to uh, more or less ban the idea of weapons in space. Um, I think because uh, their feeling is that uh, although it, these things probably won't work, and there's a good deal of evidence that they won't work as well as the, some of the American, uh, their American proponents think, Nevertheless, the Soviets would feel um, obliged to match it, and it's an incredibly expensive undertaking. The How research. expensive is it? Well, they're talking about appropriating um, 
something like $36 billion just for research just in the next mm. few years. And we're not talking about deployment. Remember that in order to get these things to work, all sorts of things that we haven't a chance of doing right now would have to be done. Uh, the laser mirror system that they showed in the video the last time I was on, mm -hmm. um, to make that work, you'd have to put 150 meter perfect mirrors in space. The largest meter on Earth, mirror we can make on Earth currently is five meters. Uh, and then the, the power capacity for this would be between 60 and 70 yeah. percent of the total installed generating capacity in the United States. And the hardware yeah. really hasn't been invented yet to meet it the idea. It hasn't been invented yet. Um, some of the ideas are simply non-starters. You can't, as one of my physics colleagues explains, you can't use proton beams because they, they, they bend in the Earth's magnetic field. So a lot of these things aren't going to work and we're, we're going to spend a tremendous amount of money, uh, billions and billions of dollars. And uh, we had also <coughs> had uh, Helen Caldicott on here not too long ago and she said that no matter how advanced or intricate the defense system you come up with, the other side is always going to come up with some measure to penetrate. That's yes, and it's fairly easy to do. Um, certainly, the main the main thing they can do is to use decoys, um, and uh, you can't hit all the decoys and all the real warheads, and it's going to be uh, simply saturate in effect the, the system. Also, it's simply a matter of building more missiles. Uh, the Soviets are restricted currently uh, to uh, about uh, 16 to 1700 ICBMs under SALT mm -hmm. two of which about 300 of those are very large ones. If they cranked up the production line, they could simply, uh, with existing missiles, saturate any conceivable defense. How, how can Reagan, the Reagan administration, then defend this kind of expenditure? I mean, $36 billion would pay mm -hmm. off our deficit. Yes. How can he justify it? Well, I, I think uh, it's, it's an, uh, the sort of, uh, what, what, what's the song? Dream the impossible dream. <laughs> of course it would be nice if we could remove the threat of nuclear war. Um, but it seems to me a very much more cost-effective way to do that is disarmament. Uh, right. <laughs> after all, if you simply got rid of the things, then they wouldn't be a threat anymore. So I think that nuclear disarmament is a far cheaper way of doing what is, is a marvelous goal, getting rid of the, the, the nuclear threat. To give you some idea of the, the expenses involved here, the, the American defense buildup that's been going on for the past five years or, um, is um, $1.6 trillion. Oh. If you spent a million dollars a day since the birth of Christ, you'd have spent half that. That, that, is, how, that is how much money it is. Well, let's look at uh, it from reducing the nuclear mm -hmm. threat. Is, how, would he how, how can you say, if you were to put your Reagan hat on for a second, mm -hmm. that Star Wars' this defense initiative does reduce the threat of nuclear war if we know that indeed the mm -hmm. Soviet Union would spend money to penetrate? Well, the, the assumption is how that do you sell the what, idea? what they say is that if the Soviets um, decide that their missiles would be intercepted by the American defense system, then they'll stop building those missiles and do something else. Uh, but of course they could get around this, uh, these, these defenses. No one's claiming they'd be effective against submarine launch missiles. They are, of course, ineffective against cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many other things the, the Soviets could do anyway. Um, moreover, the, the Soviets would not do that. The, in the past, every time there's been a question of an American technological breakthrough, they have immediately gone full bore uh, to try and uh, get around that, uh, and, and always successfully. The, the Soviets play catch up and they imitate American mm -hmm. technology. All major weapons innovations since the Second World War have been American ones, but they always manage to catch up with a lag of about five years. Is, is the race for superiority now completely out of control? It, it will be, I think, if this uh, goes ahead. What I am hoping for, and I, I have a certain amount of faith in the American people and through them, uh, uh, Congress, um, that when it becomes clear how much money is going to be tossed in this, uh, in this direction uh, and uh, how, to what little effect, I, I think, and, and given the, the problems that the deficit is already causing for us and, and, and them, of course, in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the, their economy, uh, I, I have a feeling that uh, there will be a great deal of pressure not to go ahead with this. And as, as Reagan's second term winds down and he becomes more of a lame duck, uh, one can imagine this will, will simply begin to uh, sort of uh, fade off into the sunset. I know it's always endless speculation about who the world powers are going to get along, but Reagan and Gorbachev, what is your sort of gut reaction to that? Do you think that there's a no, hope for return know. to detente of it? Well, um, I'd like to believe so. I think um, anything would be better than the poisonous state of relations. Uh, uh, the trouble is, of course, it's not just Reagan, but the people uh, on the extreme right who, uh, such as, uh, uh, well, frankly, Kappelman is, is one of them, um, Edelman is another, and uh, 
uh, Dick Pearl and uh, Richard Deputy, Pearl. Yeah, um, is, Ooh, uh, Helen Caldecott. Called, yeah. they call him the Prince of Darkness. Well, he's, it's pretty close. Uh, these <laughs> people are are absolutely ideologically anti-Soviets in the worst possible way. They um, they're not prepared to accept a kind of uh, um, working relationship with the Soviet Union. For them, the Soviet Union is the evil empire. So there might be a change in attitude, at least coming from the Soviet Union. I, I, I think so. Um, if only be, uh, the only thing one could say about Gorbachev is what's known, which is he's he's younger, healthier, better educated um, than any uh, than any Soviet leader, and that I suppose can't be all bad. Your calls to Professor Mike Wallace on Star Wars: The Peace Talks. After the break. Lasting world peace. That is the hope and prayer of all mankind. And that, uh, together with my message of condolence, is the purpose of this next leg of our long journey, uh, our trip to Moscow. I'm speaking with Professor Mike Wallace of UBC, who's an expert on Star Wars. Is it possible that the American strategy might be to break the Soviet Union financially, in other words, force them into coming up with some kind of countermeasure to penetrate an SDI? Well, of course, if the Soviets feel they have to go ahead with this, then it will hurt their economy severely. There's no question about that. But I think they will go ahead sooner than accept military inferiority. I think you have to realize that three times this century they've been attacked by technologically superior nations mm -hmm. um, and uh, have lost in the process in those three wars uh, over 40 million people uh, and they will do anything to prevent themselves being put in a situation of technological and military inferiority, inferiority again. At any price? At any price. Mm -hmm. Go ahead please. Yes, good morning, uh, uh, is it Dr. Wallace or Mr. Wallace and uh, Steve. I'd like to ask uh, uh, you, if I can, what do you think about Mulroney and his kind of copycat attitude towards the Americans, since he's Irish and so is Reagan? Uh, he finds some su similarity there um, with his uh, updating our radar system. I think it's called a pine liner. It was called something in that term. It's rebuilding the dew line. Yes. I think he means in the Arctic. Yeah. It's not clear what that involves just yet. Um, Are we aligning ourselves too closely to the Star Wars initiative? I, I do wish, of course, under the, um, uh, under the previous government, uh, Canada's policy was not to get involved uh, in the uh, strategic weapons business mm -hmm. at all. Uh, we compromised a bit, and I think incorrectly, on the cruise missile testing. I think that um, backtracked from our own excellent policy of suffocation, which we put forward, or Trudeau's, in fact, personally put forward at the uh, disarmament conference at the UN in 1978. But then the government um, can't impose a double standard on the NATO alliance, can uh, it? Well, no. you have to, there are a lot of uh, powers in NATO who remain in NATO and yet do not participate in the, uh, in the deployment and testing of strategic weaponry. The most the Scandinavian states, the Benelux countries are backing out. Belgium and, and Holland are backing out of it. In, and then there's New Zealand. Um, there's New Zealand. Uh, they say they're an ally, but they don't want anything to do with nuclear weapons. Um, there's Greece uh, taking a similar position. I, I don't think we'd be at all unique if we backed away from the United States on this one. Um, I think that's we, we we're not forced to take a, a pro Star Wars, pro nuclear position. I think it is a voluntary position taken particularly by the, the, uh, the, the Prime Minister and the new Minister of Defense. So, that answer your question, caller? Yeah, it does. And also, uh, one more quick question. For uh, children under the age of 10, what uh, type of pressure does the event of a nuclear war do you think uh, it brings? Uh, upon them, if We've you know heard a I mean. lot of this children being yes. living in fear of the. I've, um, well, I have three children myself, and I can tell you that uh, certainly the older ones are worried and express that worry to me. Um, and uh, I, I know of studies that uh, suggest that this is a major worry, and that uh, many children, in fact, having seen things like the day after or threads. That was uh, a become, brutal film. Uh, yes, they are. But uh, even then, I think perhaps understated. But at least they got across the fact that you'd have a, a collapse of society at, at the best to medieval conditions. Go ahead, please. Good morning. I'd like to make a suggestion. Why bother building the Star Wars weapon system at all? Why not put the money into something useful? Let's say uh, a giant orbiting solar power station or um, mining the asteroids. Uh, Orbital farms. That, that might be just as expensive. <laughs> well, it would be. Why not? Um, why not provide clean water for everyone on in the face of, of of the earth? You could do that for about three days worth of global defense expenditures. Mm -hmm. Go ahead from Kelowna. 
You know, hello. I uh, hope you can bear with me a little bit. Uh, I'm getting a little suspicious about uh, this whole Star Wars program, and I'm rather suspecting that Reagan is going to uh, bankrupt perhaps the whole world with this uh, little plot that he has in mind here. Well, it's important to remember, too, and as you stated earlier, is that the hardware isn't even in place, nor has it even been invented yet. That's right. <clears throat> no one. W it's a dream. Yeah, it's a dream. No one even quite knows what sort of hardware you would want to invent. There's a debate as to whether you want to get the, the missiles with lasers in the boost phase or with a kind of a giant shotgun in the uh, terminal phase. And there's uh, these new things, these particle beam well, weapons? Well, particle beams won't work because they'll bend in the Earth's magnetic field, as one of my colleagues in physics pointed out. Um, so you can't do it that way. Does that answer your question, caller? Not really, because I, I seem to see a pattern here that, uh, you know, with the restraint programs in Canada, the uh, bad economic situation all over the world, mm -hmm. I think uh, Reagan has already been going on with this uh, scheme of his, and uh, the rest of the world is being asked to pay for it. Well, the uh, rest of the world is paying for my it. My question yeah. sort of relates to the people you had on before, too, because <clears throat> And with all the cutbacks in social services, et cetera, and the heavy spending in the defense uh, budget, uh, you know, what do you expect but crime? Uh, you know, people are going hungry, uh, people are going without work, people are becoming desperate, and uh, with the youth, uh, they don't even see a future. It doesn't matter to them whether a store owner has a gun or not. Uh, it's a quick end to something that they feel is going to happen anyway. Yes, I think the, uh, the, the sheer desperation of so many young people may be partly related to the bad economic situation and to the, the nuclear fear, both of which are more or less direct consequences of the defense buildup. There's an argument as well from the business community that perhaps we can capitalize on the expenditures in the United States and get some of the industries up here to, towards uh, I don't think, uh, I, I think that, uh, look, I, I know the argument that defense spending creates jobs, but many, many economics studies have shown that uh, for every defense job for a given amount of money, you could have four or five jobs in other sectors for the same amount of money. And that's because these uh, defense expenditures are highly capital intensive, and we're not going to get the big contracts up here mm -hmm. that make the real money. And when we do uh, get a contract, we're going to have to uh, offset a large part of that to, to buy the licenses and mm -hmm. the parts to get those contracts, so it's always going to be a one-way street to our disadvantage in, when, in the defense area. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I, I just have a basic question, uh, uh, and it's this. Uh, what, uh, you know, they talk about Star Wars technology, uh, they talk about, you know, various sophisticated uh, interceptors for air breathers, um, but what is to stop me from putting a Hiroshima-sized bomb in the back of my station wagon, taking it down to Seattle, parking it at 6th and Stewart, putting on a 24-hour timer, take a bus back, and good night, Irene. Well, I think what Nothing he's asking, all. <laughs> the weapons getting into the hands of terrorists. Mm -hmm. Well, that's bound to happen. Um, all you really need is a little plutonium, uh, and it doesn't even have to be particularly highly enriched. Mm -hmm. um, and the only thing is that if you didn't know what you're doing, you'd probably kill yourself uh, the with process. the plutonium because it's incredibly lethally poisonous. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's quite possible to do uh, is if you could get some reactor waste and, and uh, uh, precipitate out the plutonium, I suppose. Uh, there, there is a, a good deal of worry about this. You need about 20 kilograms of plutonium. Um, and unfortunately, more than that goes missing every year in the United States. Oh, frightening um, possibility. So it, it is a problem. Yeah. And yes, uh, uh, also uh, some small country uh, might get a hold of, uh, of uh, one or two weapons. And you wouldn't even need a delivery system, as you point out, if you just put it in a ship or something, right. or in a cargo ship, anything. Yeah. One more short segment of calls with uh, Professor Wallace after the break. We just have time for one real short segment with Professor Wallace on the Star Wars issue, so if you could keep your calls and questions short. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to uh, ask the gentleman if he could uh, go back a little bit and elaborate on his statement of uh, being able to solve the uh, water uh, problem in the world with three days of expenditure uh, on uh, global arms. So I'm going to hang up and listen to his reply. Okay. I was just taking a quote from a book by Ruth Savard on uh, world military and social expenditures. If you look that up in the library, you can. Uh, I'm no expert on, on water problems, but uh, the point is that <coughs> the scale of expenditures on defense is so great um, compared to the civilian side 
we tie up over half our scientists. Um, something like one sixth of the global uh, government budgets are spent on uh, on, on uh, arms, and about half of that is uh, in NATO. Uh, and just think of what we could do with that money. It's absolutely uh, astounding. Yeah. We wouldn't have to uh, be racing around to solve problem after problem. And and when the United States and the Soviet Union get together to solve a human problem. You know they do pretty well. One thinks immediately of, the, of, of smallpox. There is no more smallpox. It's gone. But and so it's gone because the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to cooperate mm -hmm. in an eradication program uh, throughout Asia and Africa. But suppose we did achieve disarmament. What would, what would we do without the industrial military complex? Uh, I think that the human race is sufficiently ingenious. Look at the great periods of our civilization uh, in which there haven't been military threats and we've been able to burst forth in the, the early Middle Ages, in the Renaissance, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, early Han period in China. Uh, one, one could go on and on. Uh, and I think the human race can find plenty to do without Something else planning do. its destruction. Right. Go ahead, please. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, here's a question for your guest. Um, could it not be possible for Canada to, through its uh, Department of Agriculture, to propose that there be a joint or shared program between Canada, the United States, and the Soviet Union to help the underdeveloped, starving portions of Africa and other parts of the world uh, to promote better crops so that these people can help feed themselves and get water and irrigation to the farms and resettle people where they can uh, feed themselves. Well, that would be really nice. You know, one of the, uh, the areas in which uh, North America is ahead of most of the rest of the world is agricultural technology. Um, and we're about the only area of the world that has lots of food surpluses these days. Um, so yes, I, I think uh, the United States and Canada could take a useful lead in, in doing just that and diverting even a small amount of resources in the military to this would have an enormous impact, I think. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, I note with interest, Mike Wallace, that uh, you were able to, at random, rattle off the names of the Soviet delegates to the Geneva disarmament talks while remaining aloof and vague on the names of their American counterparts. Who's along with George Bush? Well, the, the uh, delegation is headed by a fellow by the name of Max Kappelman. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned Richard Pearl as yeah, well. Yeah, no, Richard Pearl isn't, isn't there, the delegation. And He's Paul in the State Department. Nitze is mm -hmm. the most experienced one. Um, he was involved in the, um, uh, the uh, Euro missile talks, which collapsed. Um, and uh, he was uh, involved in uh, the exploratory talks with the Soviet Union prior to that. Um, he is, uh, like all the Reagan people, a hawk, but at least he's experienced and I think uh, he's prepared to do a deal with the Soviet Union. Do they understand the Russians and vice versa? Well, uh, they, uh, I'm not sure they, they are prepared to accept that the Russian, uh, Russians have their own interests that they want to see protected as well. Yeah, there seems to be um, this pervasive fear and paranoia on both well, sides about each other. Yeah, that, but you see you the thing around? is the American position uh, current positions say essentially that uh, uh, disarmament will proceed by first dismantling those weapon systems in which the Soviets have an advantage. Um, now, obviously, they're not going to go along with right. that. Nor are the um, Americans going to go and, and vice versa. So uh, what's needed is, a, uh, as with SALT, a trade-off where each side um, concedes some reductions in the weapon systems in which they have an advantage in return for a corresponding reduction on the other side. But so far, the Americans haven't put forward a proposal that even is remotely acceptable to the Soviet Union. Most of them, in fact, are more um, extreme than the initial negotiating positions of SALT I and SALT II, which had to be abandoned later on. Um, and so I, I, uh, unless there is a real will to compromise in a major way, I don't see that these talks are going to move very fast at all, if, if indeed they'll, they'll move. On that note, we'll leave that topic. And my thanks to Mike Wallace for coming in on such short notice. Again, thank you very Glad much. I'll be back after the break with Dr. Geraldine Schwartz, a neuropsychologist who's going to teach us how to think a little bit better after the break. <laughs> Dr. Geraldine Schwartz is a neuropsychologist in Vancouver, and she has come up with a thing called thinker sizing, which I think helps me think better. Anyway, she's just speaking of NATO, been back at a uh, scientific affairs committee within NATO to talk about uh, 
thinking, I suppose. Is that what you were talking about? That's right. The, the conference was on thinking, and um, uh, when I was there, I, I heard some of the uh, latest state-of-the-art uh, thoughts in the field, and perhaps I, I'd start by sharing that with you this morning. I suppose our, the world leaders involved in the disarmament talk should think. And <laughs> right, they weren't it. at the conference. <laughs> <laughs> right, the ones who needed to be there were. That, that's right. So tell me about thinkers, I think. What is that? How can we think better? Well, perhaps I could start by saying that I think that we're in an evolutionary moment in the, in the history of mankind. And maybe I could confine my thoughts to, uh, to three basic ways in which these things on, are converging on each other at the moment. Mm -hmm. At NATO, I heard that we're beginning to devise new ways about thinking about intelligence and conversely measuring intelligence. Instead of looking at intelligence as we did at the turn of this century by trying to separate retarded and normal people. And IQ tests. And, we all and IQ tests. They're beginning to look at excellence in our own time. We are in the dawn of the third millennium in the, in the 21st century. And people are feeling that the kinds of intelligence that will be required in the 21st century are different from what we've had up to now. They're talking about what we call triarchic theories, and people like Sternberg out of Yale are devising new ways to assess them. Triarchic means three, uh, and so it will be multidimensional. Not only will we be looking at the left brain analytical logical way of measuring intelligence, the way Western technology has, has forced mm -hmm. us to think, but also we'll be looking at uh, ways of, of understanding through our emotions and, and many multiple ways of, of knowing. You want to take us into another step and expand our abilities to think in larger spheres? That's, that's right. And in fact, we'll be measuring by looking at how excellent people perform and looking at the various dimensions of their intelligence. And one of the, the things that's very important and will be in the 21st century is our adaptability. There will be too much knowledge for us to accumulate a bank of knowledge. All we'll ever be able to do is access the data. So the most important things kids learn in school these days is how to think. And, and how to use a computer, I suppose. You keep, you know. Right, right, that's true. But using a computer is, is just a minor tool. Children will use computers the way we pick up pencils. Mm -hmm. The most important thing they'll, be ha they'll have to be able to do is develop new kinds of concepts. Are the two inextricably linked, though, computers and the new age, the way we educate our children to think in this great, on this higher level? Well, I think they are, but computers are a tool rather than a, than a way of thinking, and they will become more and more of a tool. One of the things that's going to happen, though, is that children who are in school today are 21st century citizens. They will spend their working life in a, in a period of time where they will need multiple ways of, of knowing. The other thing that's converging right now is the whole field of neuro, in the whole field of neuroscience is neurotechnology and machinery like the PET scan, which allows mm -hmm. us to watch how the brain thinks. Uh, right now is at its very beginnings, but at NATO, I heard them talk about the functional architecture of the brain. We don't really know much about the brain, do no, we? When you come right down to no, it, no, we? we don't. And in fact, uh, we know that 99% uh, of everything we've learned about about the brain has been invented, discussed, discovered in the last 10 years. And the amount of time for which that's true is becoming less and less. So that uh, enormous things are, are happening immediately. But let's, just coming back to the whole notion of that technology, as we are looking at the functional architecture of the brain, the current neurosciences are, uh, neuroscientists have as a task uh, understanding how the brain is functioning. And now for the first time we can watch how it thinks, imagines, creates, etc. You mean with a PET scan I can actually take a picture of a brain in the process of yes. fantasizing, uh, well, you, thinking, dreaming? Right now you can take a picture of the brain and we are beginning to devise ways to look at how we fantasize and dream. For example, suppose I, I ask you to think about the last moment you were angry mm -hmm. or um, do I dare an erotic <laughs> moment? Let's not get into that. <laughs> that sort of thing. I'm or, over it now. <laughs> well, think, 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 about, uh, think about the street that you lived on when you were 12, mm -hmm. or your grandmother's maiden name. Okay, got you it. You access yeah. that right yeah, away. It, yeah. And how is that different from remembering numbers, or mm -hmm. facts, or processing music, mm -hmm. or doing arithmetic? So we'll be able to look at that. Now, when looking at the third dimension now that's, that's developing very quickly is a whole field of human potential, where we're beginning to understand that we only use a very small part of our brain, and, and that's what thinker size is about. That interests me. Okay, with that in mind, what, how what do we do now differently in teaching our children? 
how to expand this higher level okay. and make us all feel real stupid. That's a terrific question because it's not only the children that need to be taught. Mm -hmm. I feel that people between 10 and, and 80 uh, have access to a more powerful brain. And thinker size, uh, we have just finished the first segment uh, for children 10 to 18, and in April we're beginning our first adult demonstration class. It's about creating more powerful thinkers, giving people access to the right part of their brain, their ability to use their unconscious, their dreams, their fantasies, their images, to work together with their left brain and do uh, the tasks that will have to be done in the 21st century. For example, uh, I always say to the students that if just think of a, a group of people having a tug of war mm -hmm. and the, the teams have one hand on the rope and they're, they're pulling and one team sees that it's losing and the captain feels it's not against the rule to put, put the other hands on the rope mm -hmm. and then he does that and so does the team and they, they have a much more powerful pull and they win the game. Basically using both sides of your brain is giving you a more powerful thinking process. And, uh, but it isn't just airy-fairy and, and uh, that kind it's of thing. It's actually a physiological function that it we can actually accomplish. That's right. And uh, research has been done lately coming out of the Soviet Union, coming out of Britain, coming out of the U.S., uh, with documented data on uh, more powerful methods of thinking. Thinker size is a synthesis putting together of these researched ways to teach people to think better. We have a very short amount of time left, and I just have to ask you, because I read in the paper on Sunday that you've come up with a method how you can transplant a brain. Oh, I knew you were going <laughs> to do that. Can, can I get a new brain? I mean, you know, <laughs> I may need one after this 90 minutes. <laughs> when we first discovered how the, how the blood circulates through the heart, if people had said to William Harvey in 1682, is this going to lead to heart transplants, he would have had an absolute fit, right? right yeah. uh, if somebody asks us when we're at the very beginning of understanding how the brain functions, does this lead to brain transplants, I have to say the same thing. Inevitably, the technology is going to create yeah. a situation where that's potentially true. But not today. But not today. Okay, my thanks to Dr. Geraldine Schwartz. Fascinating topic. And I'll be back after the break. If you want to learn more about thinker sizing and discovering that other side of your brain you haven't been using all these years, Geraldine Schwartz will be beginning lectures on April the 19th at the Vancouver Learning Center. Jack will be back tomorrow. He seems to be getting better and over the flu. And with him will be David Boweri, who has written a book about Greenpeace and the Inuit, and David Sinclair, a big shot from Coopers and Librand. He's going to be talking about what should be in the budget on Thursday. And Jack will be here tomorrow at 9 a.m. precisely. Showdown in Surrey on Check at Midnight.